Masechet Gitin, Daf Yod, Dalid. We introduced the concept of Ma'amad Sheloshtan, a statement of Rav that says, if you are holding something that belongs to me, I can come and tell you, hey, don't give it to me, give it to my friend here, right? He's my plumber, whatever. And uh, I want him to have it. As long as all three of us are present, uh, then just by saying that, give it to him, uh, the uh, that already counts as an acquisition. Uh, it's already uh, his. It's no longer no longer holding my item you're holding his item uh, we mentioned that this is a right because even in cases where there are different reasons that we propose don't apply this halacha still applies and so now we're going to see some stories and applications of this law so Rav, this is Rav himself, who is the one that told us about this law in the first place, tells Rav Acha Baradela that I have a cup of saffron uh, with you. So it seems like saffron, um, a, a popular spice, was actually used kind of like cash. People would carry it from place to place for commercial purposes. So he says, I have this saffron that you are holding for me. Um, uh, listen, don't give it back to me. Give it to this person here. And I am saying this in front of him, right? All three of us are here. And I will not retract the statement. So we're reading this at first as if, as if it's two t- different things. Number one, give it back to him. Two, I want to let you know I'm not going to retract. Now we ask, um, So does that mean if he didn't say the last line and he did want to, want to retract, then he could retract? says, no, that the last line is actually just explaining the law of Ma'amad Sheloshtan. That whenever you do Ma'amad Sheloshtan, just by having all three and saying it, that automatically means that um, I cannot go back on my word because just by saying it, the transaction is already affected. So this is not an added statement that, oh, I'm doing my Shiloshtan, and also I commit to not not uh, changing my mind. He, Rav was actually simply explaining that uh, because we're doing it in this way, uh, therefore I cannot retract. Now we ask, Hold on, why do we, why does it have need to explain this? We already know that this is the law, and this is the statement that we've quoted earlier that um, Rav explains, if I, you have $100 that you're holding for me, and I say, go give it to that person, and all three of us are there, then the acquisition goes through. So I would know from there that it's not retractable. Why do you have to explain it again that he cannot retract? Oh, because if I had the, that original statement of Rav, the general statement, I might have thought that it's necessary to do Ma'amad Sheloshtan only if it's a high-priced item. Uh, but if it's a small-priced item, like, uh, you know, this um, uh, measurement of saffron, I would say maybe it does not need to be in front of all three. And that I say, oh, listen, you have this, uh, you know, little item there. Uh, just give it to that person. Even if that person is not present, then it would be legally binding. I would not be able to... Uh, take it back. I might have thought that, thought that, and that's why Rav, in this case, wanted to explain, listen, even though this is only just a a, a little measurement of saffron, not worth that much money, um, I know that I cannot, re, I cannot uh, take it back, um, but it does need to be in Ma'amad Sheloshtan in order for that to be true, right? If there was, if all three were not present, then he would be able to change his mind and said, you know what, I changed my mind, don't give it to him. Um, it only works, um, it only uh, is binding if all three of us are present, whether it's a large amount or a small amount. Now, a story. So there was three, uh, there was these gardeners uh, that were, they all were, they all did some work together and they did a calculation and turns out that one of them uh, has five extra uh, um, more than the others, right? They all, I don't know, either got paid or split some profits. And one of them ended up with five that extra. So Amri le Yehavin hu nihale le mare ara ba pe mare ara ve kana mide. So the other gardener said, "Listen, don't pay us back." 
uh, this money. Instead, we all owe this landowner uh, money. So you know what? Give it to him on our behalf. And that landowner was present also. So this is a ma'amad shaloshtan. He agreed to that. And the landowner then went a step further and actually did a kinyan. Kana mine. He did, uh, he could have done a kinyan halipin. And so he would have, uh, the gardener would have given him some item, a pen or a handkerchief, and said, by giving you this, so now you, um, you will have to give, you obligate yourself to give me these five istere zuze. All right, so he's going to have to give it to him. But the gardener then went home later, and he recalculated all the amounts, and realized, actually, he did not have any extra money that he was holding. Um, there was, it came out even. He didn't owe anyone any money. So he came to Rav Nachman to ask him what to do because now he obligated himself to pay this landowner uh, on behalf of all the other people this extra money, but it turns out there is no extra money. Rav Nachman says, how can I help you? First of all, we have the, we have the law of Rav, Ma'amad Shiloshtan. All three of you were there. You agree that you would give the money instead of to the gardeners. You would give this landowner five zuze. And also you did an actual kinyan. So the money is already given over to the landowner. So I can't help you now. Rava was there also and objected to Rav Nachman. And he said... The, this gardener did not say, I refuse to give, right? Now I'm changing my mind. I don't want to give it anymore. He's not saying that. He, if he owes it, he, if he owes it, he would give it. What he's saying is that, Leka Gabai, I don't have any extra money that I owe. Um, the whole, I only obligated myself because I thought that I had extra money that didn't, that I owed other people. So I said, okay, fine, I'll give it to him. But now, but actually, it was based on a mistake. Oh, if that's the case, now, Rava, help me um, elaborate the law better, understand the situation better. And this was an acquisition of error, right? If I sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, you come and say, oh, see, you sold to me. You have to give it to you. I say, actually, I never owned the Brooklyn Bridge. I wasn't mine to give you. So this is the same thing. This is a, it is an acquisition. We did an act, but it was an error because it was about money. I only want to, I said, I'm going to give you money that is extra that I owe them, but I don't owe them any money. So I don't have to give the, the landowner anything. All right, good. Itmar holech man. So we have a machlok between Rav and Shemuel. If a sender says to a messenger, Holech, take this hundred uh, um, coins to that person, the receiver, because I owe him this money. And let's say he wants to change his mind is one question. And the second question is who's responsible if the messenger loses it on the way? So Rav says, the sender is responsible. If he gets lost on the way, the sender still has to pay and has to send another hundred dollars. And furthermore, if the sender changes his mind, says, you know what? I don't want to pay him back right now. Uh, messenger, come back and give me money. The back, money, give me back the money. He cannot. Now, Rav is hard to explain because if the sender is responsible for the money getting lost, it sounds like it still belongs to the sender. Um, so then, why can't he take it back? We'll have to explain that. Uh, Shemuel says, no, the two go together. Shemuel's easier to understand. Since I, the sender, am responsible if it gets lost, that means it's still in my hands. Right? The messenger is my messenger is an extension of myself. And therefore, if I want to change my mind, this is an extension of my own hand. I can tell the messenger, oh, wait, 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 wait up, come back. I don't want you to give it anymore. So Shemuel does make sense. So um, let's try to figure out the reasoning behind uh, behind the machloket, and then we'll understand that better. So Gemara says, Lema bahakami palge, the savad holech ke zeche dame, or savad holech lav ke zeche dame. Okay, it's going to be an important uh, point. It's going to, we're going to see this a lot today. Um, that Rav says, if by, by saying holech, take this, it's the same as saying, 
acquire it on behalf of the receiver. So the messenger is not simply a messenger, um, a shaliach holacha, an extension of my hand. I'm actually asking him to be a messenger for the receiver and receive it on his behalf. This would explain why, I, according to Rav, I cannot take it back because once I give it to the messenger, it's as if the receiver already got it. And so I cannot change my mind anymore. But now I have a question. If the receiver, it's as if he already got it, why am I responsible if it gets lost? The answer is, Zachin la'adam shelo befanav ve'en havin la'adam shelo befanav. I can do something that is beneficial to a person without asking them. The receiver is not here. So the receiver, would if you go and ask him, receiver, would you like to accept this hundred dollars? Oh yes, I want that hundred dollars, right? He owes it to me. And, but then if you ask the receiver, do you want to be responsible for it while it's being transported? The receiver would say, no, that's a liability. I don't want to be responsible. And so here the messenger accepts on behalf of the receiver the payment so that it is given and I can't take it back. On the other hand, the receiver does not accept the responsibility in case it gets lost on the way. And so that explains the difference, uh, that explains the split law of Rav. Whereas Shemuel says, hold the word holech does not mean acquire it. Uh, so uh, therefore, the messenger is simply an extension of my hand. I am responsible and I can take it back um, because holech is not like zechi. So uh, should we say that this machlok with Rav and, Sh- Rav and Shemuel parallels the machlok between whether the word holech means zechi or does not mean zechi? And we say not necessarily la de kula ama holech ki zeche dame vacha behakami palge amor sabar lo amrin amigo amor sabar amrin amigo maybe in fact everybody agrees that the word holech is like is saying it is um acquire it on my behalf and so that's why we can explain Rav easily. And Rav does not, is not going to say amigo, that the two, the two laws have to parallel each other. In fact, you're acquiring it on behalf of the recipient, so I can't take it back. On the other hand, you're not acquiring the responsibility um, of it on the way. Rav says that. Shemuel, on, on the other hand, uses amigo um, uh, logic, right? Since the sen- since um, I bear responsibility as the sender, therefore I have a right to retract it. Right, the two, the responsibility and the benefit go together. And so, since the standard receiver would not necessarily want to re- want to receive the responsibility, he would also not want to receive the um, the uh, uh, the money. Right now, he says, I'd rather not the money not be mine. And so until it gets here safely, and so according to Shemuel, the sender can um, take it back. Tanya Kivate de Rav. We have a Braita that supports the opinion of Rav that splits the difference between the laws. Holech mane lefloni shani chayav lo. Ten mane lefloni shani chayav lo. The Braita elaborates with more formulations, either holech, like we just said, or ten, if I tell the messenger, give this hundred dollars to this person, or holech mane lefloni pikadon sheyesh lo biyadi. Ten mane lefloni pikadon sheyesh lo biyadi. It doesn't matter if I say it in the language of a loan, if it's a loan, or if um, I'm holding on to some some item on behalf of him, a hundred dollars that I'm holding uh, holding for him, watching for him. All in all these cases, when I give it back to the when I give it to the messenger with this formula, I the sender, I'm responsible for it on the way. And if I want to change my mind, I cannot change my mind, which is exactly Rav's statement. Now, Picadon Le Male and the Sono Shehe Picdono Biyad Acher. The Gemara asks a question about that Braita that equated the cases of a loan and a deposit. <clears throat> and it says both of them, the sender cannot retract. Um, hold on. Regarding a loan, I understand. Um, because the uh, receiver would want the messenger to receive the loan. Uh, back the loan on his behalf so they can get paid back, right? So we can assume that that would be a zechut for him. But when it comes to a deposit, an item, right? And so you're holding my um, engagement ring for me. And so if then you are now you're giving it to a messenger. So I may not want the messenger to have my engagement ring. It might lose it on the way. And so it would be better for me that you just keep it. And I don't want you to send it at all. So since I don't even want the messenger to even receive it, 
in addition to I don't want I'm not going to take responsibility if it gets lost. I would rather he not receive it at all. Therefore, it should be that the sender should be able to take it back because the receiver doesn't want the messenger to have it at all, right? And we answer yes, indeed. Amar bizera kishuzak kafran, and therefore he limits the baraita to a case where the sender is has been established as someone who is a denier or someone who is untrustworthy. He denies. Oh, what, 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 what deposit? I don't have anything that you're holding. In that case, somehow they uh, that this person got his hands on my uh, wedding ring. And um, I, in that case, um, I, if he gives it to a messenger, I'm like, yes, please send it with the messenger because I don't trust you in the first place. That's the case where the sender cannot take it back. But otherwise, if it's someone that I do trust, then I would want that person to hold on to it and not give it to the messenger. And therefore, in that case, the sender would be able to take it back. He says, you know what? Uh, maybe it's a better idea if I just keep it and not send it. And the recipient would be happy for that to happen. Okay, Rav Sheshat, Havale Asharta de Sarbele Bemehoza. We're going to have a couple of fantastic stories. Uh, Rav Sheshat, he had a credit of cloaks in Mehoza. In other words, he sold cloaks and he gave some on credit to a merchant. And so that the merchant would go sell it in Mehoza. And so now this merchant has Rav Sheshat's money in Mehoza. So Rav Sheshat tells Rav Yosef, Oh, you're going to Mehoza? When you come back, or when you're there, can you get the money for me and bring it back to me? And so Rav Yosef goes there and he meets the merchant and the merchant gives him the money. Now the merchant says, can we do a kinyan so that you take responsibility for the money in case it gets lost on the way? I don't, I don't want to be responsible. Can we do a kinyan? You could do like a kinyan chalipin. Um, and so that um, you will incur any responsibility. And Rav Yosef says, yes, I will do that. Right, meet me tomorrow at the train station. Uh, but ultimately, Rav Yosef escaped him and didn't show up at the meeting. And because he thought, why would he want to take responsibility? Uh, he's doing uh, he's doing Rav Sheshat a favor, but he doesn't want to have to take responsibility in case it gets lost on the way. So And so Rav Yosef eventually did come back to Rav Sheshat and gave him the money and explained to him what happened. And Rav Sheshat said, "You had you made the right decision not to take responsibility upon yourself for the money because." A Pasuk Mishle says a borrower is a slave to the lender. And if you take responsibility, that means you would be a slave to this to pay back this money. And who wants to be a slave? Who wants to be indebted in that way? Another version of it is basically the same, just a little bit shorter. Um, you did good because um, uh, you're, not, you're not making yourself, you're not violating this Pasuk. Otherwise, you'd be a slave to the lender. And so um, it seems that Rav Yosef had to say, yes, I'll, I'll agree. I'll, I'll agree to take responsibility. Uh, come back tomorrow and uh, we'll do a Kenyan on it. He, I guess he had to say that. Otherwise, the merchant wouldn't have given him, given him, given him, given him the money or he would have asked for it back. Um, so he says, yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'm going to take responsibility. Just, you know, wait, uh, wait here. Um, but then he didn't because um, it's uh, who, no, nobody wants to have that responsibility. Okay, another story. It'll be a ha, but it'll be Oshia Havale is peka de chaspa ben hardea. So, uh, he had this silver vessel in the Haradea that some guy was holding for him. So, he has these two friends who are going to the Haradea. He tells them, So, he says, Listen, you're going to the Haradea. When you're there, can you please bring it to me? And so they did. They went to the Haradea and and they found the guy who was holding this uh, this silver vessel, and that guy gave it to them. Amri lehu nikneh And now that guy, the, uh, who, the, the the who was holding the deposit, said, "Can we do a kinyan so that you will be responsible for the vessel? I want you to take responsibility in case something happens on the way." Amri lehu la. They said, "No, we're not taking responsibility. We're just doing a favor. We'll transport it." Amri lehu la halan. And so. The original guy then said, okay, then give it back to me. If you're not going to take responsibility, then give it back. 
because otherwise I'm going to be responsible. So the bidostai, but the bianai, am I lehu in? The bidostai says, yeah, I'll give it back to you. Fine, you know, I'm not going to take responsibility. You take it back. The bidostai, but kifar, am I lehu la? The bidostai, but kifar, the other, his friend, his colleague said, no, I'm not giving it. You already gave it to us as a messenger, and now you can't take it back. And so I'm going to I'm gonna just deliver it, and I'm not taking responsibility. Havu kamisa'adu leh. But now the person who was holding the, the, in the Haradah started torturing um, uh, Rabbi uh, Yose ben Kifar for not taking not giving it back. And then Amad leh hazi mor hechi ka'abid. Rabbi Yose ben Kifar tells his friend, Rabbi Dostai, look what they're doing to me. They're beating me up. Malehu tab remule. This is good. Yes, keep beating him up. He tells the, uh, the 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 one who was holding the deposit, right? Hit him again. Hit him again. Crazy story. In the end, ki hatu legabe amale hazimor la mistayeh de la sayan ela amal lehu name tab remule. So it doesn't. The story doesn't tell us what happened with that vessel. Presumably, this was a the guy that was holding it was a mafia thug guy, and he got it back. So they come back either with it or probably empty-handed. Uh, I mean, when they when they come back to Rabbi Ahai, who sent them in the first place, Rabbi Yosef ben Kifar said, "Master, Rabbi Dostai, first not only did he not support me um, in in uh, in keeping the uh, the silver vessel, I was trying to get it to you, right? Not only did he not support and say, no, we're not giving, not giving it back to you. Maybe if we had a united front, then you know he wouldn't have done anything. But he added to make it worse. He said he told the thug, hit him again, hit him again." Why did you do that? Why did you want the guy to hit your friend? The Bidostai says, I wasn't going to start up with these guys. These guys were um, in, uh, were in Amma. Now, an Amma is not very tall. That means they were very tiny. I think it probably means that uh, one of the parts of their body was an Amma big. And their hats, they had these huge hats that were an Amma tall, uh, which was seems to be something that Persians, uh, important per- Persian people did in fact wear. Uh, these kinds of uh, big, big hats, and uh, and they would speak as if from their midpoints, from their bellies. When they spoke, they were like a very baritone, and their even their names were scary: Arda, Arta, Fili, which means some kind of a maybe it means um, a elephant. Um, and so they're scary names, and these guys you don't want to mess up, m- mess with them. If they say to their you know their henchmen, uh, uh, tie him up. They, they tie you up. If they say, kill him, they kill a person in a second. And if they killed Dostai, meaning if they killed me, who would give my father, Yanai, another son like me? I wasn't risking my life for your golden, for your silver vessel, and I wasn't going to risk my life to help out, uh, to help uh, save my colleague. So the Bihai wants to probe further and says, these guys, are they, they have close ties to the government? Yes, they do. Persian government. Is it, do they have horses, mules that run before them, then servants, and they have a whole entourage? Yes, they do. If that's the case, you did you, you did right to save your life and get out of there. And um, it, then unfortunately, it was at the expense of not only of the silver vessel, but also of his friend who had to get beat up a little bit more. But uh, more important to save your life and be able to live another day. All right, great story. Now, Now we have a case of um, the sender says, give this $100 to that person, and the messenger goes, and turns out the person is not around because he died. So now what should he do? We have two B'raitot that are contradictory. One B'raita says, give it back to the sender, return to sender. The other B'raita says, well, you're going to give it to this receiver, he died, so give it to his inheritors, because if he got it, then he died, so it would have gone to his inheritors. 
Um, so therefore, just give it directly. How can we explain the contradiction between these two b'raitot? Lema b'haka mi palge. Demor sabad holech kizache, umor sabad holech lav kizache. Oh, let's say that, let's assume that these two b'raitot are arguing along the same lines of the issue we've already been discussing, that the second b'raita um, th- uh, assumes that if, uh, if a messenger, if a sender says holech, it's as if he's saying, I want the messenger to acquire it on behalf of the receiver. And therefore, once the messenger receives it, it's as if the receiver already received it. And then if he dies, so it will go to the inheritors. Um, so that's uh, that's why it goes to the inheritors. Whereas the first Padaita thinks that when the, when the sender says, here, take this, it doesn't mean that it's acquired. It's only acquired when the messenger goes there and actually gives it to him. But by the time he goes there, the person's dead. So now there's nobody to give it to. And so therefore it should return to the sender. And so now we can line up the Machloket, right? says not necessarily. In fact, we can assume that every or both, but I taught think that the word holech does not mean that he wants the messenger to acquire it. And there's no contradiction between the two. Uh, one is talking about when the sender is a healthy person. A healthy person, if he says something, his oral words are meaningless. They, uh, they don't take effect right away. Um, uh, rather, it only takes effect when it gets there. So the first Padaita um, is a healthy person, and he said, take this. By the time he gets there, the person is dead, so there's no one to give it to, so bring return to sender. Whereas the second Padaita is talking about someone on his deathbed. The oral command of someone on his deathbed, the rabbis give it force, and it, uh, it takes effect right away. And therefore, since the person on the deathbed said, give it to so-and-so, um, uh, and then that takes effect immediately. And so that person, the receiver, already has it when it's in the hands of the messenger. And if that person dies, so it goes to one of the inheritors. That's why you should give it to the inheritors. Or another way of explaining the difference between these two, but I taught is both cases are talking about someone on his deathbed whose words take effect immediately. But the um, uh, the Braita that says you give it to the to the heirs, the second Braita, is when the receiver is alive at the time that the person on his deathbed gives it to the messenger. Since that person is is at that point alive, so when you give it to the messenger, it takes effect right away. By the time he gets to the person dies, but it already belonged to the receiver, and so therefore it is given to the inheritors. Whereas the first badaita um, is where the receiver already died at the time that the guy in his deathbed said to take it there. Since he was already dead, so at the time that he said, give this to so-and-so, that person was not alive, and therefore there is no, no one, um, he, the messenger received it on behalf of a dead person. So he did not receive anything at all. And that's why when he realizes that, oh, he had been dead long before the command. So that's why the first Padaita says, give it back to the sender. Uh, I can explain both, but I taught in a different assumption that both of them are a healthy person. How to meet. Mekabel bechaye noten, ha demit noten bechaye mekabel. The first padaita that says return to sender, that's in the case where the receiver died while the sender is alive. And so the sender who was healthy, so therefore his words do not take effect immediately. They only take, uh, take effect when it got there. And by the time the messenger got there, uh, the recipient died. So, well, there's no one to receive it. So take it back. Uh, back to sender. Whereas the second Braita is where the sender died while the receiver is alive. So he was healthy. So here's the difference. Um, If someone is already sick and his deathbed says give it, then it takes effect right away. Someone is healthy, then their words do not take effect right away. However, if that healthy person suddenly dies, right, something uh, uh, falls on him, and he, not because he was sick, but he dies suddenly, then there's another principle that one should fulfill the words of, of, a, of a deceased. We're going to see his principle inside in a second. So once he died, we say those words, you know what, we, sh- they, we are going to go through with them. Since he had now died, and so um, we should now have to go through with them, therefore the messenger uh, continues on his uh, messengership, 
and gives it to the recipient and it doesn't go back to the sender or the sender's heirs. All right, so now we have different ways to explain that, but now we have all the principles ready to um, understand the following complex baraita that's going to give a whole number of different opinions about this issue. So now we're going to try again to say that this issue of whether the word holech uh, means also acquire it or not is the subject of the machloket uh, among tanaim. Right, so we're going to try it again. And this beraita is going to have a whole series of different opinions from different tanaim. The sender says, take this hundred dollars to this recipient, and he goes and finds that the recipient had died. So it goes back to sender. That, this is like the one that I taught that we already had before. Now makes it more that's Tanakama, we're gonna call him. Now it gets more complex. Met Mishaleach. Not only did the receiver die, the sender also died. Now the messenger, he doesn't know what to do. Both the, the person he sent to died, the person who sent him died. What should he do with it? Does he give it to the heirs of the sender? Give it to the heirs of the receiver? Or I don't know, keep it, uh decide what to do himself. So we'll see. Different opinions. Met Mishaleach. Rabbi Natan ve Rabbi Yaakov Amiru Yachzeru Liyorshe Mishaleach. So if the sender dies, Rabbi Natan and Rabbi Yaakov say it should go back to the um, uh, inheritors of the sender. According to that, it would say Holech is not Kezache, right? The, he said Hole, he said send this, but now that he died, so it would no one received it because he didn't say it didn't he doesn't mean acquire it, so it goes back. The Yeshomrim, Leoshe Mishen Ishtalechu law. The Yeshomrim says, no, you give it to the heirs of the um, receiver. That opinion would, that opinion seems that he would say, um, Holech is like Zakeh, and the messenger received it on behalf of the receiver, and therefore the receiver died, give it to his um, children. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi Amar Mishum Rabbi Yaakov Shamar Mishum Rabbi Meir Misva Lekayim Devrei Hamet. Rabbi Yehuda says this: There's a commandment to fill the words of the deceased, even if he was healthy and said it and then died. You should. According to this, it seems that when at the point that he says it, when he's alive, we say Holech is not Zache, and therefore. Um, uh, no one, uh, no, no, therefore, really the messenger should give it back to the uh, sender. But in this case, because the sender died, and we have this principle, Misfala came to admit now that he died, whatever he said to do, even though at the time that he said it was not binding, now it becomes binding. And that's why we would give it to the um, uh, the inheritors of the recipient. Hachamim Omerim Yachloku Hachamim say we're not sure which one it is. It doesn't go to this way or that way. Half 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 to the inheritors of the sender, half to the inheritors of the recipient. Vekan Ameru Ko Ma Sheirse Shaliach Yase here meaning in Babel. This is a very interesting phrase. It means that in ba- this, but I taught usually are only from Eretz Yisrael, right? They're all Tanaim from Eretz Yisrael, like in the Mishnah. Um, but here we have a Babylonian addition to the Baraita, kind of a Babylonian Baraita, as it makes its way to, ba- to Babel, or maybe someone in Babel had an opinion that was reported in Eretz Yisrael. But it says Khan, so this is um, this is a version of the Braita that is being repeated in Bavel and reporting on a uh, an opinion in Bavel. Okay, so that's that's very, very interesting. Anyway, Khan in Bavel, they said, well, the Shalek can do whatever he wants. Now he should use his best judgment. He knows the sender, he knows the recipient. Does this did the sender mean this as a personal gift to the recipient himself? And now that he died, he would not want it to go to, to be given to the children? Or is he are they family friends? And he would want it to go to the to the children also, because he was close with all the members of the family. He would know the situation and he would know what the intentions were. And so the Shaliach has to do his own investigation and figure out what he thinks is the best choice.
אמר רבי שמעון הנשיא, על ידי היה מעשה ואמרו, יחזרו ליושע משלח. רבי שמעון הנשיא, we have never heard of a person named רבי שמעון who was a נשיא. We have רבן שמעון בן גמליאל, maybe it's that person, the Gemara will discuss this um, at the end of the פרק. Um, so, but he had an actual case that happened to him, and he looked into it, and he was told, um, you should give it, you should send it back to the, in, the, the heirs of the sender. Okay, so that's all the opinions. Some of them overlap. And uh, let's see. My lab beha kamipalge. The Tanakama Sabat Olech love kezachedame. It seems that we can understand each of the opinions along this line, these lines. Tanakama says Olech is not acquiring it. And that's why Tanakama said it goes back to the sender. Right, Yachzeru la Meshaleach. Rabbi Natav Rabbi Yaakov Dame Holech Lav Kezache, and they also say that um, he does not acquire it, and that's why their opinions were: it goes back to the Yorshe Meshaleach. If the sender dies, it goes to his inheritors. Rabbi Natav Afagav. But they also say that even though the sender died, they don't uh, they don't agree with the principle that you have to do whatever the dead person said uh, to uh, his last command. We do not have to do. Therefore, even though he died, it doesn't go to the uh, recipient. This just goes to the um, inheritors. The Yeshomrim here said uh, that it goes to the inheritors of the recipient. And so they would say that Holech does have the same meaning as acquire. The Biudan Asi Amar Mishum Rabbi Yaakov Shamar Mishum Rabbi Meir Holech Lav Kezachem Mi Huech Ademit Amrin and Misvah Lakeir Nekem Devir Amet. The Biudan Asi agrees that Holech does not mean that you acquire it, but if the person was healthy and then happened to die afterwards, um, uh, uh, then we do fulfill his words. So, if he was alive and remained alive, it would go back to sender. But once he dies and the messenger still has it, well, have to, to have to do what he asked, and he's going to then go and give it to the recipient or the, in the uh, inheritors of the recipient. Chachamim say split it because they are in safek. They're not sure what they're uncertain. So, do it half half. Ve'kan amru shuda adif. Whereas here in Bavel they said discretion is best because if you do half half, then someone is losing out on half that they deserve. So therefore, um, figure it out um, between the parties and use the messengers to use their discretion. But the Bishimon Anasi Masea Talashmuina the Bishimonasi the Bishimon Anasi is not adding a new law, but just indicating that there was an actual practice that happened to him, um, and uh, they told him to uh, give it back to the um, inheritors of the sender. And so it wasn't just a theoretical case, but it was an, a practical case. Okay, so therefore we saw some of the opinions say Holech is like Zache, and some of them say Holech is not like Zache. So you see that they um, split along these lines. Um, so is that the the uh, the best interpretation? The only interpretation? This is not not necessarily because um, we'd rather that uh, if each one of the Tanaim, each one, each person who says. Um, later on, who says, Holech is Zacheh, we'd rather that they can be, have support from all the Tanaim. And the other opinion also should have support from all the Tanaim. So, we, yes, we can, in fact, in, reinterpret this Baraita. Rather, if the person was healthy when he sent it, then everybody would agree that a healthy person who says holech does not mean acquire it, and so there's no acquisition, it would go back to the sender. Why is there a machloket here in our, in this paraita? We're actually talking about someone on his deathbed. And the very, very principle of whether the words of a shrib mera are binding or not is subject to machlok rabbi elazan banan and the tanaim in this paraita are lining up some are agreeing with rabbi elazan and some rabbanan what do each of these tanaim say רבי אלעזר אומר אחד בריא ואחד מסוכן נכסים שיש להם אחריות נקנין וכסף ובשטר בחזקה ושאין להם אחריות אין נקנין אלא במשיכה 
Rabbi Elazar says, whether a person is healthy or, or, or in danger, meaning on his deathbed, um, it doesn't matter. His words are not, are, are not effective. If they are the um, items that has serve as a guarantee, like land, then the only the ways to acquire land are various money, through a document, taking possession of the land, like locking the gate or doing some work on the land. That's how you acquire land. If it's things that you don't use as um, as a guarantee, movable items, then you have to actually uh, pull it, right? Uh, pull it or lift it, and that's how you acquire those things. And so it doesn't matter if you're on your deathbed and you say, I want this person to have this land or this um, uh, animal um, or this box. Uh, they all have to be done in the normal way. So he disagrees with the whole Shrib Meda special law. <laughs> say if a person is sick on his deathbed then land and movable things can be acquired through speech alone and so that's what they're arguing about um, now this Mishnah continues so um, the, the the sages told it to be Al Azar. Uh, so how could you say that it, uh, the 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 words of a Shri Mera don't do anything? There is that famous case of the um, of the mother of the sons of Rochel, um, and she was sick. And she said, I want this brooch, a special, very beautiful brooch that I have. I want it to be given to my daughters and not to my sons. My sons will inherit as normally do, um, but I want my daughter to have this. And that brooch was worth 1,200 dinar, very expensive one. She died, and the sages looked into it, and they decided to fulfill her words. And even though there was no act, the daughter did not pick it up and take the brooch and nevertheless because she said it and this is a statement of a shrib mera it fulfilled so isn't that a proof that even words for someone on their deathbed do take effect what are you going to say to that no the sons of rochel those were wicked people and the sages in that case gave it to the daughter because they wanted to withhold any money being inherited from those wicked wicked sons those sons should have died in the uh, during the life of their mother. Their mother should have buried them. You know, it turns out the mother died first, right? But it's a it's a curse. And so in that case, that's why the sages uh, stepped in and did something that is the unusual law and gave it to the to the to the daughter. But really, the law is that it should not words are meaningless even for a shchib meda, and uh, it uh, rightfully and other and and other cases would go to the sons. Um, so you see here that he disagrees. Now, Tanakama, Kirabi El Azar. Now we're going to go through each of the opinions again according to this explanation. Tanakama that said it goes back to the sender. Uh, they say, okay, even if he's a Shrimera, words are just words and it never it was never delivered, and so therefore it goes back to the sender. They also say it goes back to the sender's in, uh, inheritors. And because they say, even though the original sender died, we don't we still don't have to fulfill the words of a uh, of a person who died, so it goes to the sender's inheritors. They say you give it to the recipient's inheritors. They follow the banan, who say the words of a they take effect, and so therefore the second he says the words, it already uh, takes effect and belongs to the receive recipient or the recipient's um, inheritors. Now essentially he agrees with Rabbi Alazad that words of Shri Mera are only words and therefore you would give it back to the sender however when the person once a person actually dies now so here it doesn't really matter if he was healthy or sick because we're following Rabbi Alazad even a sick person's words uh, don't take effect but when someone dies, then the last command that he said, his last will and testament, that does take effect. And there's a mitzvah to follow through with what he said. 
And that's why um, the Biodanasi says you give it to the recipient or the inheritors. Hachamim say split it because they're not sure what the halacha should be, so do it 50 50. And here in Bavel, they said, no, better to use the discretion and figure out who deserves it the most. He was not adding a new law, but saying, oh, this is a real case that happened to me. Good. Ibaya lehu. Rabbi Shimon Hanasi Nasi hu or Mishmed Nasi Kamar. Who is this Rabbi Shimon Hanasi? Was he really a Nasi? Or does it mean that Rabbi Shimon said it in the name of a Nasi? Tashma Damar Rabbi Yosef. Halacha could be Shimon Hanasi. Um, oh, we can figure it out because Rabbi Yosef once said the halacha is like Rabbi Shimon Hanasi. So that sounds like. Um, well, he was a person called the Bishman Nasi. Well, Vadanti Balach Nasi or the Kamar Mishmed Nasi. No, even that's ambiguous. Was he saying that Bishimon is a Nasi? Or was he saying the Bishimon said it in the name of a Nasi? Tenko, we're still not sure. Um, which one it was, if this was actually his name, or if it's a Bishamon who said it in the name of a Nasi. Gufa. And now that we mentioned this statement, Amad of Yosef, Halachakar Bishamon Han Nasi, Vahakai Malan, Debresh Chimera, Kichtuvin, Vechim Surin, Damu. That uh, the story that happened to the, the Rabbi Shimon Hanasi, and now Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef is saying that Halakha even follows him, but why did they decide in that case of Rabbi Shimon Hanasi to give it, return it to the uh, heirs of the sender? After all, the Halakha that we follow is that someone on his deathbed, and we just, this whole exercise we just now did was uh, making an you know, okimta that the whole Braintah is talking about a Shchib Merah. And the Lachaz al his words are as if they were written and given. They take effect. And so if they take effect, then you should give it to the recipient's heirs and not to the sender's heirs. So why did they decide that in that case? And uh, da, so the answer is Rav Yosef, Rav Yosef Moki Labe Bari, Rav Yosef actually understands this Braita that's talking about a healthy person, not like the last Okimta, which is really interesting because this means that whenever you see in the Gemara that they, they say, oh, should we understand it this way? And they say, no, no, understand it a second way. Even though the Gemara ended off saying we should understand in Okimta that this whole Baraita is talking about this case B, in this case a Shri Mera, they're just offering that as a possibility that you don't have to necessarily explain it the first way, you can explain it the second way. But it doesn't mean that everyone then agreed, right? And here they're saying, well, Rav Yosef could, could follow the, um, uh, the alternate interpretation that they were, the Machloket is about a body who sends it. Now, wait a second. If it's a healthy person sending who sent it, who said, "Give this to item to the recipient," but the the in that story of Rabbi uh, Shimon Hanasi, he said, "Give it back to the give it back to the heirs of the sender," which means the sender had died. So how could you say he was healthy, and now you're saying give it back to his heirs that he died? If he died, then you would have to fulfill his words because the halacha, the final halacha is that we do, in fact, um, uh, fulfill the words of the deceased. So if either he was on his deathbed or if he uh, was healthy and died, either way, you would give it to the heirs of the recipient. Why would he have, um, if he was healthy and didn't die, then why would it go back to the se- to the uh, uh, the sender? And why would there be heirs of the descender if he didn't die? And the answer is to know You're right. That that version of the Brayta that you have, you have to fix it, and it has to say not send it back to the heirs of the sender, but send it back to the sender himself. Um, because he was healthy and never died, that's why his, his words did not take effect. And we say Holech is not like a, a choir. His, he, that was his opinion. And therefore, it goes back to the sender. Uh, speaking of going back and returning to sender, we say, Hadran Allah Hamevi Kama. Let us return to you the first Perek of Hamevi, because the second Perek is also starts off with the same words, Hamevi Get. So you have two Perekim that start off with the words Hamevi Get. How do you distinguish between them? The first one is Hamevi Kama, and uh, tomorrow we will learn, we'll begin ha- the second Perek of Hamevi. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'Amen.